Hi, thank you for joining me. I'd love you to get to know with me Nina Angelo. Now, Nina is an incredible lady. I met her four years ago at the Margaret River Readers and Writers Festival. And since then, she has just published her memoir. Now, it's about her parents surviving Nazi concentration camps and emigrating to Australia and her life growing up as a Greek Polish Jew. The book is called Don't Cry, Dance, a memoir of war, love and forgiveness. Now, we're going to talk about that book because that's an incredible story just within itself. But Nina has faced her biggest challenge of all. Last year, she was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. And the diagnosis obviously wasn't too good. Now, 12 months later, she is cancer free. Let's hear her story. It's an incredible, incredible story. So sit down, enjoy. Let's get to know Nina Angelo. Nina Angelo, thank you so much for coming on my show. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. How are you? I'm good, Josh. Lovely to see you. Now, we have got a lot to talk about, but I want to start off on the the topic of your book that you've written, which is Don't Cry, Dance, a memoir of war, love and forgiveness. Now, that came out about a year ago, but through the circumstances, which we'll talk about shortly, it's you haven't had a chance to really promote it and talk about it. So now this is a perfect opportunity. Now, I, I'm going to say up front, I was meaning to read it over the weekend, but I haven't actually had a chance. It's just been one of those crazy times. But I'm so desperate to read it because it's it's sort of it's a story that parallels the little bit of my own background. But firstly, just for, for everyone watching, what is the book about? Well, it started, I wanted to leave something for my kids, my family, as everybody had died in the Holocaust. So it is a story about war, love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, my parents were both Holocaust survivors. Um, my mother was a Polish girl. She was 16 years younger than my dad. Um, my dad, Alberto, was a Greek, Spanish, Jewish man. And they met in Auschwitz for the first time. Uh, for a moment, but that was their first meeting in the concentration camp. My mum had left her story for us. Uh, she wrote it, uh, typed it out on an old typewriter. Uh, from, I'd say it would be from the mid-60s, she started doing it. Wow. Uh, she, had, she had the need to write it down. Then she found out she had uh, this lymphosarcoma. And uh, she, did, she died when she was 61 but she didn't know how long she had and she really wanted to write it down. And in the book, in, in what she wrote, she remembered when she was young, you know, she really didn't care you know, about your father, your mother, where they came from. You're so involved in yourself and your own life and it's all about you. Um, until later, she was so grateful that her father had written a few things mm. to let her know who her relatives were and about their life. And so she felt that she wanted to do that for us, particularly when they had all been taken. So she did write it up until the time as a young girl, she was 16 when the Nazis, that when the war started in Poland. And as mm. you know, that was one of the first places. And she was 11 when, when she was first realized this anti-Semitism because neither of my parents were brought up in a religious family well my father his mother was my father's grandfather was a, a, a rabbi but oh, my father okay. was mm. he was a socialist so mm. he'd just go if he if he felt to but neither of us we never had friday night shabbat we never had anything so not, not practicing do. jews then no not practicing but culturally we were because mm. mm. my mum always said you can call yourself because my sorry my uncles my two uncles who survived my greek uncle nick he changed his religion to Greek Orthodox because he, this Greek Orthodox family hid him and yep. he married the daughter. And my uncle Roman, my Polish uncle, he changed his religion to Church of England, Anglican. My mother always put us down as agnostic. And mm. I remember her always said, if a canary is born in a horse stable, it doesn't make it a horse. <laughs> and so she... <laughs> Good, I isn't it? it? I love that. It's... It sticks in my head. So you yeah. are what you are. You can call yeah. yourself anything. 
Mm. You can cover yourself with whatever anything. whatever label you want to put on yourself. You can, and you can take that label off if you wanted to. Mm. Yeah, but you mm. really are what you are, mm. and they were authentic. And so I had my mum's story. <coughs> excuse me. Up until the time uh, when the Nazis got her, when the, the Gestapo yeah. found her, she was mm. on the run for many years, and she. And it's all in the book because she wrote this. Mm. Um, and then she got to the point where the Gestapo caught her and she couldn't write anymore. And I remember she, she just said that to me. And I said, look, mum, how about we tape? We knew that she had this lympho, lymphosarcoma then. And I said, how about we just do an interview and you talk about it and at least we can finish it off that way. And she was okay about that, except I kept putting it off and mm. putting it off. And I think I did that on a subconscious level because I thought that the quicker I did it, that she'd die quicker. Do you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know? it's a strange way we, the, we human beings think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I didn't. So my, my um, brother-in-law, he did, did it. He actually interviewed her mm. and gave me, and I got the tapes of the interview. Now, I had a house fire in 1988 my house burnt down and everything went. Now, my mother had given me what she typed, but I'd forgotten about that. You know, I'm a, mama, a mm. single mum of twins. I just had enough problems just trying to survive through and I'd forgotten about it. And I thought I'd lost her story too, but that fell out of this, this book of, uh, of like it was a, a fool's cap book where I'd been writing notes that somehow survived. Wow. And I opened it up and I found it after the fire and out popped this, this wad. And that was, Just I amazing. had her story. Yeah, but what, about the, what about the cassettes? Had the cassettes gone too? No. Well, the second house fire, I had a second, oh, second one. <laughs> Good run of the luck there, Nina. One, <laughs> I know. And, and I, have, I wasn't even there for either of them. Right, neither of them. The second one took my mum's voice and her story. So mm. I had the, the beginning of her story and uh, a friend of mine who was doing editing at university asked me one day, would you have a short story that I could use for my final at university? And I just had my mum Yanka's story, her little thing. Mm. And I, because what I did after I, after I decided when it came back out, I thought, I've got to make copies of this. This is like a gift yeah, coming good. back to me. Mm. And because I made copies and bound them and gave them to my sister, my brother, for their families, at least we had them. So I gave this girl uh, one of those and she took it away and she got a high distinction and she came back and she said, my God, Nina, this is an amazing story. You should put your story with hers because I've done so much ah, as well. And I, yep. I came from them and I came straight after the losses that they had, I was their first new life. And uh, she said, you know, we'll put it together and at least it, it tells that story. Well, little did I know, Josh, that um, about five years ago, I had some friends visiting here. So I hadn't started on the book yet. Mm. I had some Greek friends visiting and uh, one, she was an artist and he was a, uh, an academic. Anyway, they went back to Sydney after and she, she went into the internet Next thing I get an email from her and there's a link on the email and I clicked on it and it took me straight. My father was talking to me and in French, there were wow. seven hours of interviews in the Holocaust Museum in Washington in the United States. With your father? My dad's story. Wow. So you had, remember, you had part of your mum's story and now you had your dad's story. Wow. Yes. And mm. I remember... Um, thinking to myself, you know, I knew that it was just going to be a me, me and my mum, mm. um, thinking that this was, a, this was a gift because Dad never talked about it very much. My mum was a lot more open mm. talking about things, but my dad didn't. Well, the, the men, nice... men never really spoke about anything to do with that. Even, even mm. ex-returned servicemen never spoke right. about what they experienced, and let alone if they were in a concentration camp or prisoner war camp, they just didn't speak. Yeah. And that was that's, it's heartbreaking. That's right. Yeah. And this was 1986, the year after my mum died, that this historian called Sophie Kaplan from the Jewish Museum, she was working with a professor of Holocaust studies from Sydney University. I didn't know any of this. But mm. I remember this woman coming and, uh, and interviewing my dad 
well, I remember he didn't want to do this particularly. <laughs> You'll laugh this because she was an Ashkenazi, you know, I know, you know, the Jewish, there were the mm. Sephardi Jews, which were the hot-blooded Jews from the Mediterranean, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, Greek, the Greek Jews, the Spanish Jews, you know, the ones that get out there. And then there are the Ashkenazi Jews who come from Northern Europe, the Hungarian, the Polish, the Russian, the German mm. Jews. That's my background, very, yeah. They're very different. You know, they mm. stay inside more because of the weather. The, the <laughs> and they stay inside out. more and they complain more and everything's so bad. <laughs> the weather's <They> terrible. <laughs> That's right. And they don't dance as much. No. The Greeks, you know, they get out and they dance. I've got a theory about that. People who are born in a warm country, uh, you know, in the Pacific, on the mm. islands, they're, they're, they're sort of out there a lot more than people who are born in cold countries that stay inside. Yeah, that, make, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, a bit more outgoing, a yeah. bit more gregarious, a bit more embracing yeah. life. Yeah, but you don't have the sun shining down on you all the time. And you know that how mm. the sun fee, feeds Oh, it. yeah. Oh, you know? Yeah, I know, I know, I know exactly. Yeah. So, you, so, so you had you had your mum's story or part yes. of it? And now yes. you had your dad's story by some miraculous. That I love that 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 story of how you got your dad's thing. Yes. And so, yeah. so was and so this was the time you were already thinking about writing a book, wasn't it? Yeah, I was. Uh, you know, I was sort of think, contemplating around around that I had to. I actually set myself the task that for my seventieth birthday, by the time I turned seventy, that is what I wanted to do for my family. If I made it to that. I needed to leave something behind because we have nothing. You know, when you've got no stories, mm. no photos, no nothing uh, of, of, of your uncles and aunties, etc. So I felt that it was my responsibility. I'm a storyteller. I'm mm. out there, you know, and I'm, I'm an artist storyteller. So it's important. I love stories. So that's, uh, mm. that's why I decided to take it on. Um, so when my dad's story came to me and as I said in French, I rang them. I mean, I contacted them in uh, Washington and that they sent it to me and had it all printed up. And uh, then Josh, uh, I went to Margaret place where they have a writer's residence. And uh, that's where I sat uh, for seven weeks and translated and transcribed it. Mm. Um, because I, French was my first language. French, French was the first language my mom and dad could speak between them because one was Polish oh. and one was Greek. And they spoke. <laughs> the French was their common language. Yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. born with that being. Although we spoke Greek at home and my mum and dad spoke 13 languages between them, Josh. That, that so, is, I, I, I love it. And I, I suppose it's such a European thing, isn't it? You know, oh. to speak the, so many different languages because you had to. Because well, cross you... cultures and cross boundaries and cross countries, you know, there was a lady who, um, when Andy and I were in, in Skopolis in Greece, and she was part Greek, part English, and but she spoke 13 languages as well. It's just like part of the requirement to live over yeah. in Europe is to be multilingual and all that sort of stuff. And it just well, makes you a better, well-rounded person. So, so your parents spoke, initially spoke French to each other, they, and then they... Then, then it was Greek as a family. My mum, yeah, because my mum, and you, you'll see in the book, you know, mm. she somehow through a miracle, because my dad went back to Greece. And, well, they met in Paris. You mm. see, this is, they were. This is after sorry, the war. They, once, once, once uh, after the war, they were, escaped, went down to Paris. Well, they didn't. The Red Cross took them. They, oh, were, okay. they, yep. they both went on the death marches. My father had made a pass at my mum because he was a very elite prisoner in Auschwitz. Mm. He was what was called the Canada Commando. And the Canada Commando, they saw sort of Canada as the, the land of milk and honey. And these people, there were only 70 of them, and they were all socialists. And they were elite prisoners in Auschwitz. And that's how my dad got in there. Their role was to be on the platforms, to go into the trains when they came with all the people who oh. brought everything with them. Because I thought they were going off to some, not holiday camp, but they didn't think they were going off. So they brought everything they could with them. Everything and food and, you know, all the gold Gold, and jewels and wealth and all. Cigarettes, you name it. So their job was to go into the carriages to get the bags, to get everything, while these poor people were put into the lines Mm. and went in one way or another. Mm. So because of that, my dad was able to 
um, secrete with the others. They were pretty, you know, they had to be very street smart to survive in there. Um, they would secrete things into suitcases and then they would bribe the guards yep. with all these goodies. And mm. then the guards then allowed them freedom to go to get around. Uh, mm -hmm. But as well as that, uh, they also had some themselves, which they could then use to save people's lives. And there's a couple of stories in there wow. how my dad yeah. saved a couple of lives because he had one of them was just a couple of packets of cigarettes and the cigarettes, he said, were worth about $1,000 then for a packet. Jeez. That's how... Yeah, you know, yeah, valuable that would have been, yeah. People. So that's how, you know, that's where he made that first pass at my mum. Mm. And he offered her some uh, some food in exchange for just lying on a blanket, which they had somewhere in a corner and, and a bit of a cuddle and a hug. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when you're in that sort of place, any... any mm, yep. You do you do it, Ken. It's a, it's a different world, a completely different world. Yep, yep. Yeah, but it's a survival thing. And mm. so that, so that, so they both. Then my dad was sent to another camp. I think it was Bergen Belsen or one of the others. I'm not sure. And my mum. Then the, the war ended, and the Nazis. They all went on these death marches, but separately. Yeah. And uh, the story, because it's my my mum's story, my dad's story, which I actually I actually wrote that part of my mum's story from memory. Yep. Um, of the death march and also how they met again, I call it the woman in the teal blue dress, which is a, a full a chapter, which mm. is like me coming in yep. there to, to put that together. Yeah, so, so that's how they, uh, they both went on the, the death marches mm. and the Red Cross, and then they chose to go to Paris because they spoke French. Yep. My father insisted he wanted to go to Paris. So the Red Cross, they went to Paris and they were in the Red Cross canteen where they fed them and looked after them. They were refugees and that's where they, they met again and that's where their love story started and that's when I came through after wow. that. Wow. Wow. So you had your, your mum's story and I believe your mum's story is in first person, your dad's and story is in first person, then you come in in first person with your continuation. Yeah. So it, it tracks the, the whole history of, the, of their lives and the concentration camps coming out, I think coming out to Australia. And then, yes, and then I, and then I. You're, you're born the, in Greece, weren't you? I was born in Athens. Yeah. I'm an Athenian. Good on you. You know what? Of the all the places I haven't looked travelled much in the world, Nina. Yeah. But the places that I have travelled, Greece is my favourite. I just I have this connection with Greece for some reason. Maybe it's the yeah. sunshine. Maybe it's the people. Maybe it's the food. Maybe it's the, it's dolmades yeah. or olives and feta cheese and Greek salad and <laughs> it all. I don't, I don't know, but I love. Greece and everything yeah. it embodies. So you know what it's called? It's called philoxenia. Philoxenia. Philo means French, a friend, yeah. and xenia is a stranger. It's befriending a stranger. stranger. Oh. So it's called philoxenia, and that's why people who go out in the tavernas, anywhere with Greeks, they do philoxenia. They will yes. take you in yes. and befriend you. Yeah, and that yeah. and that's what happened when when we were there last yeah. time, and it was just just amazing sense of yeah. of community inviting you as a stranger to to be part of their their world, and that's why I'm, I'm going to segue here. All the cruise ships that go around the islands, but they feed them on the cruise ship. People get off, buy a trinket, then get back on the cruise ship, and they don't sit in the divernas. They don't meet the locals. They don't eat the food. They that's don't right. do all that. They don't immerse themselves in the community. And I feel yeah. that's really, really sad. But that's getting back to your story. So you were born in Athens. I was. And just as a, an aside, because this is interesting, the reason I called my book Don't Cry Dance is in 2015, 16, something like that, I went back to Greece and I wanted to find my birth certificate because I never had a birth certificate. When I was born, there was a civil war in Greece. Mm, mm. So there I popped into the world and I came out to Australia with my parents, uh, but on my father's passport. So I thought when I was there, I was only going to spend a couple of days in Athens, but for some reason beyond my control, I ended up spending two weeks because everything I had planned to go to fell through. Yeah. So I was obviously meant to stay in my birth city. And I decided I'd try and search for my birth certificate. And I eventually, after searching, went into this office 
And I said to the man in Greek, because I speak Greek, because we had to speak Greek at home, <coughs> my name, my date of birth, and would I be written anywhere? And he pulled this old ledger from behind him and he put it out and it was all handwritten. And he ran his finger down and he saw me there. And he said, you're here, you're here. And wow. I went, oh my God, I'm so happy, am I really? And do you know what? He looked at me in the eye and he put his hand out to shake my hand. And he said, congratulations, you're an Athenian. <laughs> and when he said that, all the tears welled up in my eyes. And I said, I'm going to cry now. And that's when he said, don't cry, dance. And that's how the book got its title, Josh. I love that. That is so great. <laughs> and you're sort of almost like story. coming home, isn't it? Just that it sense does. of belonging, that, that thing. That's oh, great. look, you know, I'm an opinion. And he sort of said that. No, I mean, it was very moving. And that's how the book. And it was Margaret when I was telling the story and I was writing, writing it all in Margaret River and I was telling mm. the story and Margaret said, there's your book title, Nina. It's right there. <laughs> so um, that's how that's how that came about. So yes, with my dad having my dad's story, um, it just sort of and I put memories in it. You'll see mm. little weird little weird memories as a child, but in the book you'll notice at the top of it, the chapter. So there'll be a star, which is me talking, yep. a flower when my mum talks, and a and a hat when my dad talks. Ah, so, so that's, you that's how you, yep. yep, yep, yep. Yeah, because I thought, how am I going to, because I have to come in and bring in a memory, how am I going to weave these three stories? Where did you get that idea and from, to do it that way? I think it was probably the editors were looking in every way. At first I was going to use different font. Yep. I thought, oh, use a different font for each voice. Mm. Um. But then it sort of seemed a lot easier. And uh, I don't know, you know, I was sort of talking with, with the editor, but I needed to say, this is not me talking. Or if you were reading mm. it, you go, well, who's that now? You know, yeah, okay. because it goes from one to the other. Uh, I, I, know, I know a lot of people are, are, are doing memoirs at the moment. It's a, it's a, memoirs are huge. And, mm. and one of the things about memoir writing is, A, what do you include? B, how the research had to do the research and C, how not to offend anyone. <laughs> so, but one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because with your book, you could have easily had, because it's, it starts off with the Holocaust and, and a lot of people who have gone through that experience bring it home and where, whichever country they end up immigrating to, they bring that trauma with them and then that gets passed down through the kids and then their kids and so on. It seems with your parents, it, that didn't happen. Why is that? I think, you see, I think it was there because they, they reckoned the numbers on their arms, the tattooed numbers that they had, that was their number of, for, for life now when they got their life back. And I was born, I was their first new life. You can imagine yeah. after all their losses mm. and they were still in trauma. If the war finished in the middle of 45, I was born in early 47. You know, it wasn't was that long, yeah. trauma. I was in utero while they were going, well, particularly my mother, my dad, but more so my mum, because she was 16 years younger than my dad, mm, uh, mm. of losing everybody. And there was no one there for her until she was pregnant with a child, which was me. So all that trauma would be going into me as well. And this is where I realized after, you know, which we'll go into, I got the lymphoma and, you know, the mm. blood cancer and mm. how this was through intergenerational uh, trauma that something will bring it to the surface. Oh. Yeah, because it's, um, I've, got to, I've got to remember the word now. What's the, what's the actual technical word for the intergenerational trauma? The, it's oh. not epigenics. It's epigenics. Oh. And, that's, and, that's, okay. and that's where the, the, it's the cellular memory. And it's not... I've, Hopefully I get it right here. It's actually the switches in the cells. All the memory is there, but sometimes the switches get switched on. Sometimes they get switched off. And with, right. with epigenics, it's, it's the trauma of, of an experience will get passed down genetically, but it's only of how that switch gets switched on and off, whether they respond to that. And I think that's, and that's what they're finding out now with, with, um, with all the research 
And so yeah. it is a, it actually a thing that the, the, the trauma can get activated in the children and then the grandchildren. And I think then it comes into how much, how aware are we of what's going to happen? How aware of, of what's happened before us and what choices do we have to, to change yes. that or do something about that? Now let's yes. segue beautifully into your diagnosis from last yeah. year. How, Stage four lymphoma, yeah. that's what you were diagnosed with, wasn't it? And that's yeah. not a really good diagnosis, is it? So how did you no, feel at no. the time? Well, you know, I thought I was mourning, you know, having gone three and a half years of writing this. Mm. I didn't realise or understand about this intergenerational trauma. And I see now that it was meant to happen so that I can talk to it. What you were saying is exactly right. And before I do go into that, mm. I, you know, in my research and things that I found out that um, it, when a girl baby is born, she's already got every egg in, those, in her ovaries that she's going to need to reproduce. Every egg is a cell and every cell has a memory, just mm. as you said, Josh. When that cell becomes somebody, that memory of the grandmother, the great grandmother, whatever goes back, it comes out. It sits there dormant. For me, it was just in there and I was a happy child because my parents gave me a lot of love, a lot of love. You know, there mm. was never a moment that, that we could walk up to them, no matter how busy they were, what they were doing, and there was always a moment for a kiss on the forehead. Wow, I, I, I find them. that absolutely staggering because I, I just know a lot of – I've read a lot of stories of Holocaust survivors and the families <laughs> can go either one or two ways. One way is it's all repressed, it's all held down, and there's this this simmering resentment, um, yeah. anger, all this stuff that and that that emerges out and 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 colours the world. Or sometimes the families go in the opposite way, and they're just so grateful, and they and just yeah. just throw this gratitude around and and the the joy. And I think that's what your parents would. So you had a great upbringing, and then you start writing this memoir. And you'd yes. spend three and a half years digging into all this stuff that may have been, I don't yes. know, repressed, buried or well, whatever. But, well, you know, I was finding out things, you know, I knew a lot. My mum talked about it. And while I was writing it, while I was putting it together, I didn't think it was affecting me. I was just driven to mm. get it in there. And it was like many moments of, oh, my God, you know, like particularly my mum's story I knew a little bit more about, but not my dad's. Mm. And... Um, as I was doing it, whatever it was doing to me was bringing things up. So I got to the point where it was the book launch. So the Jewish Museum, the Sydney Jewish Museum helped me. It was very important that I have their, uh, their professor to look at it. Yep. I wanted to make sure that it was a really right and that it was okay by them. Mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone thinking I was making up fictitious stories. Yep, no, exactly. That's, that, and the, that topic of the Holocaust, yes, you've got to get that sort of aligned Absolutely. with that. Yeah. So while, <clears throat> while I was doing all this, I um, had the, the launch at the Jewish, the first launch at the Jewish Museum, uh, that the professor actually did the launch for me there. And then I had another launch up here on the central coast of New South Wales, where I live. Um, at the library, oh, nearly 200 people had come, but I wasn't feeling very well for quite mm. a while. I really thought I was going, I was grieving because I never do grief very well. And I, you know, I'm very pragmatic about, you know, I mm. know death is just, uh, it's just taking our coat off and putting it over there because our spirit lives on. And I found this out while I was going through this. So I, I was not good at all and I was losing a lot of weight. And mm. people were seeing me, I was shaking. And um, my family just said, mom, go to the doctor. Cause I didn't go to doctors or anything like that. I was really healthy, full of life. I've got a formidable spirit that just mm. wants to do so much. But the body, you know, we've got the physical and then the spirit, the body was going, no, I'm falling apart. So I went to the doctor, had scans. And in the first scan, the PET scan, it showed, and I knew I wasn't working well. And I'll actually, when I show you the three, uh, the three artworks I did of my transformation, you'll actually see the scans because my last one is the scan where all, all the cancer showing through and then the one where it's all gone. And mm. so in that, oh, my whole body was just lit up. My pelvic area was just covered in it, into my bones, into my blood. They told me I had these rogue blood cells that were munching away through my blood. 
which I thought was ironic because I was writing this book, which was about my blood, my ancestors. The ancestral blood. line, yeah. Connecting, yeah. you know, connecting through blood. And, um, and they said, you know, that I better get onto it pretty quickly. I have a cousin, my first cousin, my uncle Roman, my Polish uncle, um, his, his daughter, she's a associate professor of uh, nuclear medicine and the head of department of the Prince of Wales Hospital in, in Sydney. And uh, she said, Nina, you're going to have chemo. I did not want to. I wanted to do it with the medicinal cannabis and do it all naturally because I was a natural type of girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said, if you don't do this, it has to get hit really quickly. And I didn't know it was a stage four at that time. Nobody oh, told okay. me, I actually. Oh. Yeah. I actually read it in the report. Why didn't I? Not I, 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 hear, I, hear, I hear a lot of stories when people get that initial diagnosis or something. They only get half the information or the, the doctors or the staff only deliver half the information. They don't want to give the yeah. full story. And I, I don't understand that. Anyway, so keep going, keep going. Yeah, he was pretty, like, you know, the doctor's pretty good, but he didn't sort of say you got stage four. He said it was not good. And, the, and I saw the scans. And I thought, but, oh, do, but all those do they? Do they? But obviously, he said, "Look, you need treatment now. Otherwise, oh, without absolutely. without any treatment, you're not going to survive for the next year or something." No, absolutely, the the hematologist, the specialist, because mm. it's not an oncologist when it's in your blood, yeah. um, said, "You Nina, you're really going to need this because we've got to get this quickly and we've got to get it fast." And I said, "I'm I want, I'm going to use this cannabis oil. This I just want you to know." And I told my GP that too. I'm going to use it. I've been use it. And that will go with it. It's not negotiable for me. Mm, and mm. yes, I'll go the chemo. I understand because I don't, you know, want to try whatever. And so that's how I, I went and I started having uh, the chemotherapy. Six sessions they put me down for and I was really going downhill. I could hardly walk. The pain, it was really painful. My poor family because all my muscles went and my skin mm. was sagging and people were used to seeing me full of vitality right, yep. and um <clears throat> now i'm just gonna I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna stop you here nina yeah sure, i'm just gonna sure. i'm just gonna let people watching know that this is the amazing bit is that you are now cancer free yes i am and and i think that's the most amazing thing but i think what's even more is amazing is what you feel was the transformation and what what changed? So let's let's walk through that. So you you've been diagnosed. You've got stage four lymphoma. You're feeling like crap. You you basically you won't last if you don't start doing chemo. What happens? Right. I decided that I was not going to fight it. I was going to trust and surrender. Do everything. Eat well. Do everything. And with my family, lucky my two children who are like forty eight. My twins. They. My son was living here at home, but my daughter came back after 17 years and moved in too. Mm. And so with their love and also the love of community, plus me surrendering. Another really important thing, I think, Josh, was that I decided, being an artist, that I was going to document this journey, not only in words mm. on social media, but not as a victim, because nobody wants to talk about having cancer. It's almost like you've got some sort of sexually transmitted disease. They go, they go in and they yeah. don't talk about it. They don't want to admit it like there's a shame involved in it. And so from the beginning, I thought, I'm going to get this elephant out of the room. And mm. I thought, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to say, help me get this elephant out of the room or, you know, whatever, mm. because the element of talking about it. When you are going through this, you're holding a mirror up to other people's mortality because it is about your mortality. Yeah, and, and people, people don't, don't want to admit that. They don't know how to talk to you. They, they, it frightens them. And they sort of go, I've, I should be ringing her up. Oh, I'll do it later. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I, what, what are your thoughts around the, the, the narrative and the language that is used in the public domain in the media surrounding cancer you know you've got words oh, like yeah. battle fight um you know lost their fight with cancer and like i'm going to struggle through this what what are your thoughts on that kind of language well i hadn't even thought i always thought i'm a good surrenderer and i decided i'd do that trust and surrender but i never realized until uh, probably a month and a half ago i was talking to a friend who had been 
caring for a woman who was, had cancer and she'd lost her life. She, cry, uh, she died. Mm. Mm. And my friend said to me, she fought. She said, she fought to the end. And I went, oh, my God, I never fought once. I surrendered. And I said that to her. That word fight is such a part of our culture because when you fight, you're putting pressure on yourself. You win or you lose. You mm. challenge yourself and you put pressure on your body, your mental state in every way. And so I went, I just surrendered. And I knew that that was a key word. We so don't... It's, not, it's not surrendering it. It's not giving up. And that's one no. of the differences. I think we need to establish the difference because when you say surrender people here, oh, I just gave up and laid down. But no, that is You're different. Right. You're right. You're right. And that's, that's the difference. And when I found out that only 1% of people who have been given a life-threatening diagnosis actually change their life, change their lifestyle and do something about it. One percent, Josh, I couldn't believe that. Mm. And I asked my doctor, I asked my specialist, I asked the, the nurses when I was having chemo and they agreed. And there were people sitting opposite. There was one woman I remember sitting opposite me and she's sitting there. She's a rough diamond, you know, mm. but she's sitting there, drip, drip, drip. And then she's out having a cigarette. You know, she told me she had lung cancer and she's in the parking area having a cigarette because mm. people mm. don't like to change. If change is so hard. Because yes, you get addicted yes. to the way you live your life and you go, oh, well, might as well drink myself to death. I might as well keep continuing. I'll do more of it because I'm going to go anyway. So what's That's the, the point? Is that the giving up? I think that is the giving up. Because, well, you just sort of go, oh, well, you mm. know, I'm going to, I'll just get, I'll just get so off my face that I, you know, I'm mm. going to go anyway. It's fear. They got into yeah. fear. Yeah. And look, that is you know? so understandable because it, it's almost like, I, I could assume that getting a diagnosis like that, you would have to go through all the different, it's like a grieving process, mm. the, the anger, the denial, the, the why me, the, the, the bargaining. Did you go through yeah. all those stages or did you just jump straight to, this is the universe telling me something I need to listen? That's exactly what I said because I never did, went into the denial or anything. Mm. I'm very pragmatic. And I'm very authentic and I just thought, all right, this is it, I'll do it. But I must, with that said, there were a few mornings and I'm not a big crier or anything like that, but there was a couple of mornings where I would just sort of sit on the end of my bed crying, just sobbing. Mm. It just came up in me. And um, I think, you know, with the chemo in my blood and also the, the steroids, incredibly amount of steroids, particularly yeah. after chemo, they give you like five days of huge amounts of steroids, which actually have affected my eyesight, which I didn't know, mm. but these are all, all part of it. But I, I, I believe that f not for one minute did I give into it. I just really just thought, all right, this is the way it is. And um, I'm not going to deny it. I'm just going to write about it and I'm going to do art. I yeah, Tell me about the art you did. Tell me what, what happened there. Okay. Because this has been a big part of it. It's, you know, people call it art therapy. I'm an artist. I didn't ever like the idea of therapy with art um, because I think when you think of therapy, you think, oh, when you're better, you don't need it anymore. I think Ooh, when you're an I artist, never thought of it when, like that. But it's yeah. true, isn't it? You have oh. occupational therapy to get better and you get mm. physiotherapy yeah. and all that. Mm. Therapy, you know, makes you better. Yeah. But it wasn't. To me, it was trying to use a way of expressing myself just like I was writing posts to mm. how I was feeling. I was just writing posts and I guess I did it because I feel like there's another book coming up and I wanted to document how I was feeling but not as I said not in a victim sense and by being authentic people really appreciated it out there on social media on my Facebook because mm. so many people talk themselves up and here we are up here and we're having a drink and here we're doing this and aren't we great? People really appreciated real, the real. Mm. And they would write and say this. So it started, uh, I started my first one with the book. I was doing the last proofread of my book in Fiji. I was on my island because I've been going there for like 30 something years working helping them set up their little income generating businesses because I was a, I'm a fabric artist yep. and I have a long affiliation and I went there and they gave me a little bourree and I was reading through the last print, the print run 
but before they printed the books, just to make sure. I was reading it aloud to myself for the first time, and it's quite different. It, when it you changes the it. whole feel of the book when you read it aloud, oh, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. And I said, and I remember sitting there, and as I was, and I said to my ancestors, I said, I'm, I'm giving you back your names. You're in this book now. You're no longer a number. Mm. I'm, honor, I'm honouring you and all you suffered and went through. And I want you to know that we're here because of you and you're always going to go on. So that's what I said inside of myself. And I said, just go. It's all right. I've got it. Mm. And I went and lay down. So I wasn't well then, mind you. This was July last year. I really wasn't well. But I thought, I, you know, I, I didn't think about it. So I went and lay down. And when I lay down, closed my eyes, and this is what I this is what came out at me. I call this my ancestors. Can you see that, Josh? Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Okay. It's they very very out. indigenous style, very Aboriginal style. Well, yeah. Because they were pixelated, Josh. Yeah. People say that. And I go, but they're pixelated. You know, I see things pixelated. And, yes, if they, you know, if I want to sort of say, you know, yes, it's got dots, well, no. <laughs> That's know, just the way does. you painted it, yeah. That's so, how I saw it. <laughs> but is, you know, it, like, but the, yeah. the, the, the sense of the ancestors, you know the way people yeah. go, I can't visualise anything, but if you go, can you get a sense, can you imagine them? And they go, oh, yeah, I can. And it was, it was kind of like that, wasn't it? Well, that's how they came to me. I saw mm. them coming out of this dark space wow. and they're coming towards me. And so I just got up immediately and I started doing around the black lines. You know, I started quickly, the white on the black, because I always work on black. I mm. like working on black. And, um, and so I just, just could see them. There were no faces. There's no faces. There were yeah. just a whole lot of people. And, and then I started working on them because they came through pixelated. So I did that and mm -hmm. I sort of thought, okay. So when I had my book launch, I had that uh, printed big and I took it with me both to the Jewish Museum and, and, the, and I said to people, these are my ancestors and they came to me and I let them go. You know, I sort of said, go, go, you know, thank you. You're no longer a number. Mm. And so that became part of it. Well, little did I know that I was going to go into this next part of my journey. So the next part was I'm having chemotherapy. I decided, all right, I've got these rogue blood cells eating away, because as the doctor explained it, they're mm. like, I sort of saw them like little Pac-Men. Yeah, you know, yeah, Pac yeah. Men, and they're eating me up. And they were moving fast. And I thought, okay, I've got to sort of somehow smash this get them out and get new, new cells regenerating. So while I was having chemo, I decided I would only do this artwork while I was sitting there for hours while this dripping. I mm. wouldn't think of it as chemo. I thought of it as liquid gold ah. pouring through my okay. veins yep. and getting rid and, and sort of rejuvenating. So I only did it when I was doing that, so I did bloodlines. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so that's that's life. that's the chemo coming in, but you're imagining as liquid gold, and it's the healing that's, it. that's coming in. So, that's, so it's it's the whole mindset thing. Yeah, regenerating the cells and mm. putting new ones in and smashing the old ones, etc. Mm. So that was that, and that's called that's called bloodlines. I call that bloodlines, and and that gave me each time I take my paints in, and I would spend that time doing that. And I finished it when I did my last chemo. Then my third one, okay, yep. I got the, the scan. They're called a PET scan. It's really expensive. Like, you know, these scans are full on and they only pick up what doesn't belong in your body. So oh, okay. it really scans it well. And, you know, they inject you with this stuff and you have to lie in a dark room for about 45 minutes and not move. And oh, I'd be useless at that. I'm bringing my well, arms around. You'd have to, darling. Do they sedate and, you? I'd be sedated. No, no <laughs> what, but I must say, the first time, they had a little TV up in this room and they just put something up and it was, it was in Greece 
It took me, it was all these photos of the Greek Perfect. island, everything. I travelled through every part of Greece possible with Greek music and with drones and everything. I couldn't believe it. It was so wow. amazing that that's where they took me. Mm. And then they take you in and they start working on you in layers, right? Yep. And then it picks up. So this is, I call this transformation because it's got both my scans now, see the one here? Yep. You see all the white? Yep. They're all cancer. All, see my pelvic yep. area yep. is absolutely covered all up my spine, in my shoulder, and that was the first one. And then I started to see I'm trying to get rid of it in there. Yeah, yeah. And then that was the last. See the last one? It's yeah. all gone. The only bit of white there is actually my bladder because you have to drink lots of water. But it's all gone. That's amazing. And so that's yeah, the transformation that, from over a year, over a year of. That, that is over uh, six sessions. Six it's sessions. A year with, now that's all, with chemo. Six sessions of chemo every three weeks. And but you, um, you had also changed your diet. You changed yeah. your mindset. You had changed everything, yeah. didn't you? I, I, you know, I've always been a good eater of fruit and I always mm. ate well anyway. Mm. Mm. You know, I started sort of adding other things to it too. And I was given three lots of cannabis oil, different, different types. Yep. Because when you do it properly through a clinic, they pull out the things that you need. It's not like, uh, you know, it's, it's not like you can go and just get off, oh, got yeah, some yeah. oil. Just it's probably done. More in, mm. Absolutely. So, and you can see that there's a little head. See, there's a little face from behind my, oh, yeah, yeah. my spine. Yeah. That was in the scan. And a friend said, there's a face coming out from behind your spine. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God, there is too. <laughs> We're sort of internal angelic being. And so I used a bit of artistic license and took it. That's, to you're an artist. Level. You're meant to do that. and that's Well, we but, can. And, and, and I think yeah. that's what you've hit one of the points there is, is, is is we live our lives in such a, a, a linear sort of two-dimensional way and that what you've done, you've taken this, this cancer diagnosis, the whole journey, and you've, you've lit it up and you haven't been afraid. You've walked no. into that and say, so, cancer, what have you got to show me? I am going to draw this. I'm going to paint this. I'm going to visualise. I am going to imagine healthy things happening as you said yeah. i'm not going to be a victim to this and and you bring it to life and i think art yeah. not as art therapy yeah. but art in general of a way of expressing ourselves and bringing that that non uh, physical aspect of ourselves out which which yes. i advocate all the time especially in my book finding creative oh you do i mean it's, it's obvious it, that has to yes. play a great role in healing Mental, oh, without physical, a doubt. and you're living proof of that. I tell you, I've got one last one to show you. My yep. God, this really got me. 2018, right? I think I was in Margaret River still mm. working. I'm not sure. And I just decided, I don't know why I did this, and I called it Nina the Duality Dilemma. I don't know why. Have a look at this. If that Ooh. isn't as I was and as I am now, look at that. Okay, for everyone watching home, Nina used to have a shock of red hair, and that's what you were famous for, this great shock of red oh. hair. And I'll, I'll put up a picture now. This is what Nina used to look like, and this is what you look like now. So that you obviously that was a, some premonition, that some sort of... Oh, who wow. knows? 28. I just saw it the other day when I was going through them and I went, oh my goodness, how did I do that? And it's me talking to me. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is too, I had a healing of my spirit by an Aboriginal woman. And she said to me, this has nothing to do with your physical body, emotional, mental or anything. I'm talking directly to your spirit. And then she said to me, um, you're four months old. Where are you? And I went, my goodness me, like that's, I guess I'm in a bassinet in Athens mm. and there's two people there, my parents. It was from then, I realised then, because I was in utero, I hadn't thought about that before, how what they had been going through was part of, mm. was locked away in me. 
but I was given so much love. I didn't, it didn't bring anything up, even though I'd gone through tough times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it didn't bring it up in their physical, physical illness. But it was at that moment, it was actually just after that, between chemo, I had a few days where you're feeling a little bit better. And as I said, I have a formidable spirit. It wants to do so much. And I was talking to a friend who visited Josh and my spirit was going, yes, then this is not going to happen and that and the other. And I honestly, my physical body cut in and went, stop it now and <laughs> go and lie down. And I went, oh, my God. So my, my physical is telling my spirit, calm it. Settle. And go and calm lie your down. Farm. You, you've got a healing to do. And I just said to my friend, oh, my God, I've got to go and lie down. But because our spirit is so formidable that I, I listened to it. And from then on, I can tell when my spirit's talking and my body, my physical body is just going, you've got work to do still, Nina. And you, just and, you, lie and, here. You, and you have to listen to both, don't you? You absolutely do. And that's what I did. But it was interesting because um, then I, I knew that the spirit just lives on and on. You know, mm -hmm. when we go, we take the, the coat, which is us off, and um, we still go. Because Elizabeth because Kubler Ross used that analogy. She said, you know, what's death? But they said, what's death like? And she said, like taking off a big overcoat and stepping into the sunshine. Well, I don't know, but after. Straight after that, I had a memory of a dream I had about 11 years ago where in the morning it was like a lucid one and I was going to be travelling north uh, mm. about six hours that next day and this lucid dream and I was driving along and I can see it so clearly. I was driving along this road and I wanted to turn right into a side street and there were cars coming down the road and there was a white four-wheel drive and I thought, I can beat it. You know, we put our foot on the accelerator and we can beat it. I thought, I can beat this. And as I took off, I didn't see that on the other side, on the inside, there was a little low blue car flying down, mm. trying to beat that car. And it smashed through my car, crushed it. I died instantly. I'm just a, a, a crushed up missing in mm. the car. But I was still there, Josh. And I'm going, oh, my God, I'm dead. You know, this is, yeah. I'm dead. I could see myself. And then I thought, that wasn't too bad at all because I was still there. And that was in the it lucid was, dream. This was a mm. lucid dream. And then the next morning I knew I was travelling north. So I thought, is this a premonition not to go anywhere? Yeah. Is this telling me? And then I thought about it and thought, no, no, I'm going to go. But what it did do, it made me more mindful more yep. careful, do not take chances. Do not take silly Just risks. Take, your, yep. time. take mm. your time. And that was like well over 10 years ago and I'm still wow. here. So, anyway, Nina, mm. I want two bits of advice from you, okay? Okay. First, okay. Bit of, first bit of advice, what would you say to someone who has just come back from the oncologist and they've got their diagnosis of 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 cancer, whether it's stage three, stage four, whatever it is, what would what bit of advice would you give to them? Well, I guess one of the big thing is to have support around you. Never ever to knock back anything that anyone will offer you. One thing I learned, you know, uh, particularly as women, we know we're very good givers. We put out a lot, but we're very lousy at receiving. And when people want to offer you something, you go, oh, I'm okay, you know, I'm all right, don't worry, I've got food, I've got this. That people don't know how to show you their love, but by offering you something. So if somebody is going to say, look, I've made a pot of soup, I bring you some soup, even though you've got bowls of soup at home, and you go, look, I've already got soup, don't ever knock back anything because they don't know how to give you their support and their love. And that is pure love. That soup mm. is their love. That piece of cake is their love. That phone call, that rubbing of your feet, that healing, just mm. sitting there and holding your hand and being there, the phone call, anything. Don't refuse it. Open your heart to it because that's how you're, a lot, big part of your, your healing will happen. The other thing is I think, not be afraid. I know it's hard. It's, it's not an easy thing. But 
in that surrendering, like you're saying, you're not surrendering to dying. You're like, oh, I'm going to die now, so I might as well do everything and make it quick or, you know, whatever. That surrendering and saying, all right, I am going to do everything in my power to help me go through this and to understand it. Not get too much in your head space. Mm. You know, not start going over things and why is this from, why did that, all the rest of it. I think that was one of the a good thing about um, being on the cannabis oil, particularly if I was taking the stronger one because there was different ones. Mm. It would put me in a state that I was just lying there. Put lovely things around you. You know, I'm lucky. I've got, I've got trees and a lagoon. I've got a tree outside my place here, which you could see it's a jacaranda. Mm, At this it'll be a time, full bloom, here, yeah. it's, it, I was watching it blooming. Start listening to the bird songs. Get out of your hell. Just get out of your headspace. Blame because we do tend to blame. Well, this wouldn't have happened if that hadn't have happened, and this and that person's to blame. And don't go into all those places. Just, mm. you know, just do everything and then just play. You know, like I was playing with my art. Don't have any expectations. Do little things, colour in um, and just listen to music. And, you know, I know it's easier said than done. And if your body needs to cry, let it cry. If your body feels sad, just let it come through you. Don't blame anyone. Don't blame yourself. Don't be hard on yourself and surrender yourself to your healing. I, th I think, Nina, you've just given us all some life advice there oh, that we, we can okay. all implement. Now, lastly, memoir writing. What's the one lesson you learned about writing your memoir? Oh, my goodness me. I guess um, the authenticity of it, um, I guess. How was, was the we... what Was the book the book that you wanted to write or did it turn out to be something completely different? I did want to tell the story and my story, but there's three different voices. So it's one book with three stories in it. And the trick was how to give them that individual voice, but at the same time, how we blended them together. And that's where having a good editor, having p someone that you know can help you honestly, openly, listening. God, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of arguments. I want that in there. Nina, I don't think that that works. Yes, but that's part of my story and I want it in there, you know, all that sort of stuff, you know. And they go, yes, but you see, you understand. So also um, take the advice of people who have done this and who are in this business. I didn't want to sell out by getting a publishing company. I possibly could have, they possibly would have taken it on because it's a good story, but I couldn't give away my mom and dad's voices and my own because it was in the first person. And I didn't know what a publisher would do with it. Someone in a publishing house who doesn't even know me or them it was too personal to decide what to take out, what to put in, what to call it, anything like that. Mm, um, mm. I really wanted to honour my parents and my ancestors by being honest to it. Um, I would say, I I would say, I would say most, most, most publishers, when, when you work with an editor, that editor mm. will be like your editor that you had and they will help you bring out your voice and yeah. to the best the best ability to keep the story as authentic and genuine as possible. Because I know, I know a lot of editors in publishing houses are all working with them and, and it's their job to make your story as yours as possible. If you know, yeah. if you know what I mean, you know? Yeah. I really tossed around this when the Jewish museum said they'd help me, but I had to pay them. Like it wasn't mm. like mm. they were helping me as publishers helping. And yeah. I knew it was, important to have that their stamp on it mm. I think another thing about I wanted to take control of this book and and really run with it the way I wanted I want to go to schools I wanted to talk to it I also know once you sign those bits of paper particularly for a lot you give away of that so if somebody wants to buy it from somewhere else you can't do that oh you, you, still, know, you, you still have ultimate rights over your work yeah. I mean like all my but, books I have rights over my work and everything has to go through me 
that's that's how I know it, and that's that's what how most of the publishing industry works. It's not it's not as though you sign off and it just disappears and you have no control. If they want to make it like say reissue it, they've got to give back to you and go, Nina. How do you, do you want to change anything? You want to keep it the same, and then they'll work with you the whole process. So if you get like I'm just saying this, if if you get a, a publisher who wants to has read your book and go, Nina, I would love to take it to a bigger audience. Would you say yes? Yes. Yes, I would, and I would like to my next book because there's a lot. You see, I want to put in my story because my book now is book ended with my mum and dad's survival and my survival. But I think, I think you've got a great story there. And if any publishers are watching, where can they get in contact with you, Nina? <laughs> well, I've got a website now. I've got my a website. It's uh, ninaangelo.com.au. I'll, I'll put and it down here. That, yep. Yes, and that's that's uh, everything's there about my book and everything. I do want to take the book. It's, I've got to take it to Greece. I've got to take it to Poland. When we I'd can like start to... flying again. Well, and when I can do it and afford it because every bit of money, because I went, remember, the book came out and I went down. So I've mm. had a whole year where I could not take it to the next level. And that's so have you, have you, have you got now. stock of book, of, of the paperback? I, I uh, probably got about 60, 70 downstairs, but I because I was going to I was going to the Margaret River Writers Festival. I was invited to that. Yeah. And I was invited for the Greek Festival of Sydney as well to launch it. But of course, because of COVID, it didn't happen. So mm. I did do a uh, hundred books. That was all in my next lot. Yep. So I can get it done. I okay. Can get so if people want to get a copy of Don't Cry Dance, they can Go to your website and they can either order yeah. a physical copy, they can get the ebook. Yes, yeah, it's an ebook as an audio book. And an audio book. Oh, because you you narrate it, don't you? I do, I do. Fantastic. I narrate it. I have a I have a friend who's sort of an amazing composer. She's got a big uh, recording studio and uh, her gift to me for my 70th birthday was uh, my book um, to be made into an audio book. No, so I, I think, I think all, there's a little sample. Is, is there a sample on the website? Is that your mum speaking oh. or was that you? Oh, now that that's me. And I did put you're that telling, up and it's You're called, telling a story yeah. of what your mum experienced yeah. at Auschwitz. And she that, wrote that. She wrote that. She, so she wrote, so that she wrote it in first person. You've narrated it. Because that, I had right. chills. Okay, if, if you're watching this, once you finish, go to Nina's website. I think the little YouTube clip's just down the bottom on the front page. Yes. I'm not going to tell you any more, but it's the most haunting, beautiful thing you'll yeah. experience today, most probably all week. So oh, I thoroughly you, recommend Josh. that people go yeah. and, and do that. Yeah, And it's called Once Upon a Christmas Eve. Yeah, so that kind of gives it away. And I'm, I, yeah, I've, oh, well, I've had chills. I had, I, I had chills watching it or oh, listening thanks, to it. So amazing, yeah. Nina. So, look, thank you very much for your time, Nina, and thank you for sharing your story oh. with us. And, look, I'm just wishing you all the best for the future and just hope, you know, that obviously as we come out of, of, out of COVID, yes. you'll have more gigs, you'll be able to do more speaking stuff and go to schools and tell your story. And, obviously, you're going to be writing yes. the next chapter or the next oh. book in the series. And, and congratulations. Yeah, thank you. As soon as I get off and running, and I'm over in, I'm going to come over to WA as quick as I can because I have my WA family that I absolutely love and adore over there, and um, I'll be seeing you there then, Josh. We'll definitely have to catch up. Nina, thank you so much. It's been an absolute thank pleasure. And for me too. Thanks, Josh. All the best. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hi, thank you very much for watching the latest episode of Josh Langley Gets to Know. Got any questions, whether you want to say whether you liked it, you didn't like the interview, and like my hair's too grey or something like that, post a comment below. I won't get upset, okay? Now, gratuitous plug here. If you want to grab my books, Being You Is Enough, I Can You Feel The Way You Do, or Magnificent Mistakes, or all three, just go to my website at joshlangley.com.au because it's about trying to change the world one book at a time, helping one kid just to feel good about who they are and feel good in their own skin. If we can just help one child, then they may help another child, then another one, then another one, and then that's how we slowly change the world. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you next episode.